Hey, I'm Trey. Today's story is a special request made by a subscriber by the name of String Bean. Thank you, String Bean, for the suggestion. I normally try to refrain from high profile cases such as these because they've been done to death already. But I don't have a problem with doing special requests because I enjoy doing what I do. This particular story is about a killer born and bred in the United States. This monster confessed to killing dozens of people across the country over the span of several decades. If you have any questions, suggestions, or comments, please, please, please leave them in the comment section because I'm always interested in your input. Well, if you're ready, let's get started. 1940, in the country of the United States, which is also my country, and in the state of Georgia, a child was born that could have been possibly the spawn of Satan. That child's name was Samuel Little. His mother's name was not provided, but Samuel stated that he remembers her as being a prostitute. Oh goody. It was alleged that Samuel's mother left him on the street as a toddler to wander around while she turned tricks with her customers. Correction, this lady was a female creature, not a mother. Now this is how monsters are made. Shortly after this incident, his family moved to the state of Ohio so that his mother could help raise him. As a child going to school, Little had problems with adjusting. He was known to cause disruptions in class, didn't get along well with others, and he did poor academically. At age 16, he was arrested for various petty crimes which led him to be placed in the juvenile detention facility. Samuel Little eventually admitted that ever since he was in kindergarten, he was always attracted to watching women's necks for some reason. This eventually turned into an arousal and the feeling stayed with him for years moving forward. This attraction morphed into strangling women's necks to death. As he got older, he enjoyed reading non-fictional magazines about women who had been murdered, more specifically being choked to death. As a young adult, Samuel decided to leave Ohio and live with his mother in Florida. He worked many odd jobs during his time in Florida, but he never really exhibited any ambition for anything. Since Samuel was unable to figure out what he wanted to do with his life, he decided to travel throughout the country. This was more than likely because he couldn't find that connection with his mother that he yearned so much to have while being around her. During his travels from state to state, Samuel became arrested more frequently. He couldn't hold on to a job because he moved too much, obviously. As Samuel traveled, he found himself being arrested frequently for petty thefts and fraud to sustain himself. Samuel also learned how to defend himself by becoming a boxer while in prison. Eventually his crimes progressed into violence. From armed robbery to aggravated assault on up to rape. Since Samuel was a transient, he was able to circumvent being treated as a repeat offender so that he could avoid being given a harsher prison sentence. When it was all said and done, Samuel had been arrested 26 times in 11 states. Samuel committed his first murder in the year of 1971, or possibly 72. The records are obscure then. This is based on his eventual confession after his apprehension. The victim's name was Marianne or Mary Ann. Samuel could not remember her exact name, but he met her and they spent several days together on the street seeing one another. One day he saw her again, offered her a ride home, and she accepted. On the way home, Samuel decided to turn down an isolated road, and for no other reason but to see how it felt to strangle a woman, he strangled her to death. It didn't matter that they spent quality time together, and she trusted him. Samuel dumped her body in the wooded area like it was trash. Samuel would periodically keep track of any new developments involving the police. He doesn't believe that her body was ever found by the authorities. That's probably the reason why they couldn't narrow down what year he actually killed this woman in. Now after acquiring the taste for murder, moving forward, Samuel hit the ground running on his murder spree. Over the next decade, he continued to kill women with impunity. Now see, if his mother showed him just a little bit of love as she did for prostitution, maybe a lot of people would be alive today. 1982, in the state of Mississippi, a 22-year-old girl by the name of Melinda Rose LaPree decided to run away from her home for reasons not known. According to the local news, it was published that she was alleged to have had an addiction to cocaine and marijuana. 
Melinda's boyfriend at the time pimped her out for money to supply their addictions. I wasn't able to find the reports about specifically what took place during the interaction, but Melinda met with Samuel. She was last seen alive with him. Authorities caught up with Samuel and he was initially charged for the strangulation murder. The grand jury at the time didn't believe it was enough evidence to actually charge him. He was eventually released, but not before being extradited to Florida to face another killing. In 1982, in the same year as the previous victim, a woman by the name of Patricia Mount had met up with Samuel during his time in Florida. They both went to the secluded area where Samuel would strike the woman over the head first, incapacitating her. Then he would commence to undress and rape the victim. When he was done with victimizing her, he would finish the job by strangling her to death. Not all of his victims were raped though. Some were willing participants during the sexual part. Afterwards, they all met the same fate in the end. He would dispose of the victims' bodies by dumping them in a secluded field somewhere. When he was eventually apprehended years later, Samuel admitted that he didn't like to use weapons on women because it took the pleasure away from his experience. I guess this dude had no life ambitions other than snapping women's necks like chickens. He also was smart enough to know how to avoid making a messy crime scene which would reduce the chance of leaving evidence behind. It was alleged that he used his boxing ability knowing exactly how to strike these women. Although Samuel was undereducated, he was criminally smart. He chose his victims in manners that would make it less likely for him to be connected to them. These women turned out to be either druggies or prostitutes. Over the years, he had been able to avoid being charged for many of these crimes due to his modus operandi. One, Samuel refrained from leaving any or little evidence behind. Two, the victims he chose happened to be people who were down on their luck and would be least noticed during their disappearances. Three, they were all victims who had questionable associations with people from criminal elements. This was crucial because none of the victim's associates could be any type of character witness that would be considered as credible. Four, all of his victims were disposed of in isolated remote areas so that decomposition or wildlife would render any evidence left behind useless in most cases. And five, Samuel would continue to move to a new city in order to distance himself from the previous murder. In the early 1980s, Samuel would travel to the state of Mississippi and on two separate occasions, he met with different women. Their names were Hilda Nelson and Leela McLean. Both were sex workers and addicted to drugs. On each occasion, Samuel beat, raped, and strangled them, but they both managed to survive. The police were notified and Samuel was located and eventually arrested. These two women had no means of transportation, but they were so convinced that this man was a killer that needed to be dealt with, they walked to court together miles to give testimony while Hilda was eight months pregnant at the time. When the authorities had Hilda take the stand, she took one look at Samuel and became so frightened that she urinated on herself in fear. Both victims became so afraid of Samuel that they walked out of the courtroom and didn't return. No information was provided on the outcome of the trial, but due to the lack of information, I assumed that the case had been dropped. In 1984, Samuel moved to California, specifically the city of San Diego. He then met a woman by the name of Lori Burrows, who happened to be a sex worker. He was able to lure her into his vehicle. Samuel then abducted her, beat her, and then attempted to strangle her to death. Miraculously, Lori survived the attack to notify the authorities. When she did this, she was able to give the police an accurate description of Samuel and his vehicle. Several weeks later, while the police were on routine patrol, they found a parked vehicle in an isolated area with the man in the rear seat. When the police investigated, a woman was found beaten and strangled unconscious in the rear of that same vehicle. The victim's name was Tanya Jackson. She was rescued by the authorities and Samuel was arrested. The prosecution charged Samuel for various crimes in relation to Laurie and Tanya, but again, the jury would not convict him due to the victim's testimony in which they believed lacked credibility. Luckily, the prosecution then managed to get a plea bargain deal out of Samuel for a lesser charge, or he would have walked away completely free. Samuel completed two years in prison for his crimes. 
After his release, Samuel chose to remain in that area during his time in California. He murdered an additional 10 women during his time. This guy must have been in complete savage mode. He was totally not interested in finding Jesus at all. Samuel probably grew tired of the warm weather out of California and decided to take his circus back on the road again. Fast forward to 2012, he turned up in one of Louisville, Kentucky's homeless shelters. Typically, when people are in homeless shelters, their names are automatically checked by the authorities for any outstanding criminal warrants. An arrest warrant came up for Samuel Little back in California for drug distribution. He was subsequently arrested and extradited back to California. DNA research had only been available approximately 10 years at that point, so many cold case homicides were reopened. That's when Samuel was connected to at least three homicides back in California. The woman's names were Carol Elford, killed in 1987, Guadalupe Apodaca, killed in September 1987, and Audrey Everett, killed in 1989. All three women were killed and later found dumped on the streets of Los Angeles. In 2014, due to DNA evidence and witness testimony, he was ultimately sentenced to three consecutive life sentences without the possibility of parole. During this time, several states were now beginning to look into Samuel's involvement with many of their cold case murder files. I personally believe that he was starting to be concerned that he would be put to death if one of these other states investigating him were able to link him to additional homicides via DNA evidence. In 2018, Samuel notified the authorities on his own accord that he was willing to confess to additional homicides provided that he wouldn't be sentenced to death anyway. Check this out. Apparently, he doesn't have a problem with killing people, but is scared to be put to death. If that's not ironic, I don't know what is. He ultimately confessed to a total of 93 homicides that spanned between 1971 and 2005. It was alleged that Samuel had stopped his killing spree in 2005 because at age 65, he became too old to murder without taking the chance of being captured or killed. Authorities reported that they believe Samuel had a photographic memory. He was able to sketch the faces of many of his victims and be quite accurate. Samuel would remember how he killed each victim, where he dumped each body, and also their names. This is how they were able to substantiate many of his claims. Several of his victims' bodies had never been found or their deaths were mislabeled by the police as either accidental or drug related. Several of those deaths were reevaluated. Out of 93 homicides, at least 60 were confirmed as being killed by Samuel. For several years, he continued to aid the police with their investigation, supplying pertinent information. Samuel died in prison in 2020. The remaining 33 homicides are still being investigated today. If you enjoy more stories such as these, click the suggested videos above. Also, I upload new content every Tuesday and Thursday. God bless and stay safe.